Communication beyond words. Look up any interview or press release regarding The Quiet Man, and this is the phrase you'll see bandied about. Kensei Fujinaga, the game's producer, speaks of a friendship he formed with a mute child while hospitalised as a teen. That through games they were able to form a bond without speaking, which in turn inspired his approach to The Quiet Man. Ostensibly a narrative-driven game where, outside of the opening and closing few minutes of your first playthrough, there is absolutely no audible dialogue. In theory, it should have represented an admirable commitment to a vision, not dissimilar to last year's Hellblade, where providing players the most comfortable experience is put aside in favour of conveying a message rooted in empathy, one that boldly relies on visual storytelling rather than spoken exposition. And there's one moment that sticks in my mind in this regard, where he goes to a concert to see a woman perform a piano piece. We don't know her, we barely know him, but we interpret that the guy cares enough about her to watch her perform, even though he can't perceive the music himself. Eerie synth tones swirl in the air in place of hammers hitting strings, making you question the little details. Has he always been deaf? Has he ever heard a piano? Is this him trying to construct what that might sound like in his head? For a few precious seconds, you have a piece of storytelling that has you trying to truly understand our protagonist's plight. It's also the one moment in the game I can think of that isn't completely, stunningly bungled. Even that one scene is entirely ruined by what surrounds it. The establishing shot that spends literally 30 seconds establishing what was made clear in two. The unexplained appearance of a birdman and the same gang you fight almost literally the entire game because they only captured four or five enemy faces. The utterly terrible shot framing and woeful disregard of continuity, the jerky cuts between film student level FMV and horrifically ugly in-engine fare making this pretty boy look like he's been smoking three packs a day for 40 years. But most importantly, the fact that you haven't touched your controller in 10 minutes, with the game instead forcing you to watch people talk without subtitles, all of it reminding you just how sloppy the visual storytelling the game relies on actually is. See, far from going beyond words, The Quiet Man still leans on written, spoken dialogue to a degree that would feel padded and overblown even if you were allowed to understand any of it. Entire conversations in which said conversation is the focus of the scene will play out in an unskippable fashion on multiple occasions with none of it furthering your understanding of events. And this would be okay if our character was incapable of communication himself, but these aren't merely one-sided conversations we see this man, whose name is actually Dane for future reference, respond not only to sign language but to spoken dialogue. We literally see him speak to other characters. And on top of all this, despite having an option to toggle them on or off, captions only appear at the start for audible dialogue prior to entering our character's head and at the end during a song that's entirely non-diegetic. In other words, they subtitled precisely the parts of the game that needed them the least East. The game also never stops showing the same terrible flashback sequences over and over again, as well as completely halting to remind you of visual connections it set up just one scene prior. It's like the game doesn't trust you with the absolute basics of its story, yet thinks lip reading for minutes at a time is sufficient means for delivering the game's immensely convoluted plot. Communication beyond words is one thing, but when it has us questioning just how incestuous the relationship might be between our supposed hero and his girlfriend, mum, dead mum, safe to say you may want to rethink about how you're communicating that information. It's important to clarify though that the description for subtitles in the options does not say you will only understand what the character understands. Specifically, it's what you as a player are intended to understand, which is different, and does lend credence to the notion that the game was meant as something bigger than its plot. A message that, I don't know, I'm hard of hearing people probably have it pretty rough when it comes to media without subtitles. Even being generous and taking this theory at face value though, the realisation of it is utterly botched. Mainly because, in one of the strangest moves I've ever seen a narrative focused game like this make, they've only gone and patched in full sound and dialogue anyway for a second playthrough, as if to kowtow to frustrated 
talented audio engineers who questioned why they were involved in the first place, as well as the studio getting their money's worth for the hours of static conversation they shot. In a word, it is a Ismal. Somehow, in a game centred around the concept of sound, the level of quality is through the floor. Some cutscenes feature dialogue so muffled you'll wonder why they didn't do some kind of ADR. I know it's part of the path to stardom and all, but I... Some of it beefed up security. And other scenes where they clearly did maybe give you your reason. Why can't I hear? Why? <coughs> why? Spoken dialogue does nothing to react to, say, a character getting their face smashed in. No more games in the dark, day. Lived there for too long. And what's more, impact sounds will often glitch, creating a wild phasing effect. The game's soundtrack comes across as a total afterthought as eerie synth tones are replaced by grating midi piano sounds and climactic boss fights are backed by the most butt rock royalty free tracks going. And on a storytelling level, the addition of sound does nothing to remedy the heavy handedness of its flashback sequences, leaving you wondering just how many more times and for how long they're going to show you this stuff that you've seen a million times already. And while this update does give some much needed context to proceedings, the game follows through on none of it, meaning that the legitimately chilling bait and switches the dialogue adds by reframing our perception of a couple of key scenes feels entirely unearned, leaving me with more brain melting questions than when I had zero idea what was happening. So do Dane and Police Dad really think that this person is their dead relative purely because she looks like her? Why did young Dane run up and wave at two people clearly fighting with a gun pointed directly at him and his mum, and why did the mum do nothing to stop him? Are we not going to mention how he was just shot in the head and got up as some weird crow thing? What timeline are we even in here? On its own, it could have been a funny little piece of so bad it's good schlock, with some appropriately awful, scenery-chewing performances. I'm going to keep her safe. I am going to save her! And dialogue so redundant that it has characters saying, you told me this already. But the fact that this completely obliterates the supposed message of the game in favour of something so flagrantly rubbish, and that you're made to endure this train wreck a second time to see it, means that the game's trying nature goes beyond so bad it's good, and ends up just bad. And what makes this so confusing is that removing subtitles entirely, then patching in audio to fix the resulting problems, feels so unnecessary, such a scorched earth delivery of the game's themes, when the way to actually realise them seems so simple. Surely you could have the best of both worlds, both a silent game with subtitles and a story reflecting our character's disability, by just not showing us what Dane can't literally see. There are multiple scenes in which Dane will be gazing into space or paying attention to something else, while others are discussing presumably important details behind his back, as players will yearn for what we might be missing, as conversations take place without Dane's knowledge but with ours. An unusual but potentially effective kind of dramatic irony, staying consistent with developer intentions while still allowing for the story's unbearably daft supernatural twists and turns, requiring at least a little explanation. Hell, you could show incomplete sentences with some key words to illustrate the struggle of lip reading, anything but this complete dismissal of context for our actions. And to go even further, this miscommunication of information isn't limited to the story. We haven't even gotten to the mess of the gameplay itself yet. Take something that should be as simple as the tutorial, telling us to punch, kick, grab and dodge. However, instead of keeping everything in their weirdly off-centre menus with font that's one step away from Comic Sans, the team decides to spruce it up using neon signs. And I can see the thinking behind it, it's a unique presentation consistent with at least some of the game's imagery, where most games would simply display text. Like the decision to remove audio, however, it reeks of style over function. Given the limited screen space resulting from the massive controller hogging an unnecessary chunk of it, all the icons are piled on top of each other in a way that manages to be both unappealing and incoherent. 
So X is punch, but B is wall punch. Right trigger is run, but right bumper is Naruto run. As for the gameplay this tutorial is in service of, it took me nearly two full playthroughs to realise that this particular lens flare, on a screen often overloaded with similar artefacts, happens to be your focus gauge, something I originally thought was tied to correctly timing the game's inconsistent dodge, allowing you to enter a mode that, when it's not directly clipping through enemies or sending the camera flying off in some random direction, will snap you across the arena to whatever enemy the game chooses and magically break through their guard, sometimes, except for boss fights where I think you're expected to effectively catch incoming attacks, sometimes? I've played through this game multiple times and still couldn't tell you how half of this stuff works. It's incomprehensible. The developers speak of a number of moves at your disposal, but it doesn't matter, you rarely get much of a choice in what those moves are. No matter the context, whether you're punching a standing enemy or wailing on a weakened foe, whether in focus mode or not, it all comes down to mashing the X button and witnessing the horrendous animations that result. Far from being as intuitive as the developers describe, from allowing you to become one with your character, it's a technical mess that only ends up distancing you from the experience, not complex or impactful enough to be viscerally engaging, but also keeping you laser focused on its most minute inconsistencies. It's truly the worst of all worlds. But what does it matter, you'll not be playing for long anyway, given that fights last for around half a minute before devolving into further cutscenes. The moments of control are so brief, its FMV sequence is so bloated, that I was curious enough to calculate it. During my first playthrough, including deaths and not including a bug that forced me to re-watch half an hour of progress when the final boss glitched and the camera irreparably freaked out, I was in control of the game for 44 minutes of a total 2 hours and 30 30 minutes, and due to the inconsistencies of its combat system, subsequent playthroughs weren't much different. And I'm not someone who ties a game's length to its monetary value necessarily, but when it feels bafflingly padded despite a runtime this short, when over two thirds of your game involves watching meaningless establishing shots leading into incomprehensible conversations, the remaining less than a third is borderline unplayable and you're forced to endure it all twice for an insufficient explanation for it all, I can be pretty confident in recommending you spend your money elsewhere. Watch a let's play if you have to know at least then you can skip through the mundanity. And it feels weird for me to say that, given my enthusiasm towards similarly awful games. Earlier this year, for example, I did a video on Ride to Hell, a game so infamously and fundamentally broken that it was removed from Steam. And The Quiet Man is awful in almost exactly the same ways, to the point that I wouldn't be surprised if it ultimately shared the same fate. Its combat is repetitive, devoid of any sense of impact or basic hit detection. Its camera is laughably unstable, its story nonsensical, and crucially it all has the same effect, making me more fascinated with the stories behind its creation, who okayed it for release etc, than anything playing out on screen. The difference for me is that, at least on some level, Ride to Hell knew what it was. It was an homage to biker B-movie schlock that, due to endless production issues and publisher bureaucracy, ended up becoming B-game schlock itself. With the production values of the FMV sequences and the sudden supernatural turns its story takes, you get the feeling that The Quiet Man thinks it's Fight Club directed by Lynch, when in actuality it ends up not dissimilar to the PS2 version of Fight Club. On top of nearly every part of the game being broken beyond belief, it also comes across as deeply, deeply pretentious, which while sometimes funny, is maybe its most significant sin of all. So I hope you enjoyed my piece on The Quiet Man. If you did, maybe you'd like to join the wonderful folks currently on screen by heading over to my Patreon and donating even a small amount. Not only do you get access to Patreon exclusive goodies and written content, you'll also be directly supporting the show. And with the sheer amount of time that goes into every video, that support has been absolutely crucial in allowing me to release the amount of stuff that I have and keep it at a level of quality I need it to be at. I truly cannot thank each and every one of you enough for that support. 
Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Rob, Nico Blakely, Michael Wolf, Artyom Vitsyuk, Ali Almuhana, Timothy Jones, Spike Jones, Laser Ferd, The Nameless Guy, Chris Wright, Ham Migas, Travis Bennett, Zach Casserly, Samuel Pickens, Tom Nash, Shardfire, Anna Pimentel, Jesse Rhine, Brandon Robinson, Justin's Holderness, Christian Kuneman, Matthew Natchery, Nicholas Ross, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.